All right, and we are on the air. Everybody, welcome into the Fit Dimension podcast. And I am joined by high performance coach and founder of crownyourself.com, Kimberly Spencer. Kimberly, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me on, Evan. It is an honor. I am very excited to be speaking with you all the way from the Gold Coast. And I, I just I just find technology fascinating. The, the fact that we can have around the world conversations. Right. Like that's so cool to me. hundred percent. I still marvel at that. <laughs> You're in Australia. <laughs> I'm in New Hampshire of the United States. Like it's thousands upon thousands of miles apart. Yeah, here we are sitting basically at the same place at the same time about to have yeah. a conversation. It's beautiful. And I, I tend to have a lot of conversations with people in Australia. So that Australia connection, it's, it's, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a sign. <laughs> right? That's, I was just thinking the same thing. I was like, oh, this is, this is, as I think, the second interview in a row I've had someone from Australia. Ah, uh, if you get three, <laughs> the universe is telling you, it's like, hey, yeah, third time <laughs> Australia's looking pretty charm. good. <laughs> third time would be a charm. So I would love to start. I absolutely love the message of crown yourself. I mean, that's actually a phrase that has personal meaning to me. So I saw you using it. I was like, wow, that's, you know, and the message behind it, I think is so empowering. It's inspiring. And, you know, I just love to start, uh, you know, speaking to uh, the authentic authenticity of crowning yourself and how you sort of developed that, uh, you know, the mindset behind it for yourself and sort of the journey into, you know, leading where you are right now. Yeah, so I was I was bought out of my company three weeks before I got married. I was a part of an e-commerce company. And so I was bought out and I w went off to my honeymoon and my husband and I had planned on doing six weeks in Italy and it was our test drive for the dream life that we wanted to live. We always, had, our vision for our relationship was always to travel around the world. It was to raise our kids in different cultures, experiencing learning rather than just reading it from a textbook. And so we figured we'd give use our honeymoon as a test run and we did six weeks in Italy. But I couldn't have, like I've always been a doer and like I, I've always had ambitions. And when I was bought out of my e-commerce company, I had, it was the first time for the three months prior to that, that I dealt with lawyers, that I dealt with you know, having my integrity called into check, ha having my capability called into question, having having all these questions from men thrown at me, and I didn't know what to do. And it was the first time I was I ever had crippling doubt because prior to that, I was quite audacious with just like, oh, sure, I'll write a screenplay. Sure, I'll just like, I've only been doing Pilates for three months and then I'm going to sign up and become an instructor and then in a year become the highest paid youngest instructor in the studio. Sure, of course. I've always been really audacious like that, but this was the first time that I ever experienced that crippling doubt. But I was on my honeymoon and I'd probably had way too many espressos. Like I was probably <laughs> at four. <laughs> and my husband and I, like two entrepreneurs, were brainstorming, as you do. Um, and we, as we were in our little Airbnb on this beautiful coastal village, and we, I was like, what? I don't know what I'm going to do when I get home. I was like, I, I, I figured out the body stuff. I said, but I don't want to be a Pilates instructor for the rest of my life. Like I said, that's not really, that doesn't inspire me. I love Pilates, but. Mm -hmm. It's not my jam a um, hundred percent of the time. I said, I love writing. I love health. I love relationships. I've figured out the body stuff because I went through a 10 year e eating disorder and I recovered with no psychological or medical intervention. I went through abusive relationships and then I found my amazing forever husband who is just like awesome. He's mm -hmm. just awesome. And I was like, and I, and I've done business. Like I've had two businesses and, but at the same time, that one part of the business part, I still had a lot of doubt around that. But at the same time, I was like, so I think it's like this holistic thing and it's like writing and it's, it's speaking and it's, it's coaching and it's, it's, and I leaped off the couch and I said, crown yourself. And my husband's like, what's that? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I got the name. And so I said, it's, it's crown yourself. Cause I was a pageant girl too. Um, as well. And the pageants, um, when I walked the stage in Miss California, that was the moment that I realized that I'd freed myself from my eating disorder. So it was less about having somebody give you a crown because I was like, 
I, I don't need anybody else's approval. I, I, I own my own throne. Like I, mm. I, I got this. I, I put the crown on myself. I don't need anybody to give it to me. Right. And it was a development. I, I look back actually recently on my, my business plan um, <laughs> that I wrote back in 2015 and everything that my company preaches now, ownership, authenticity, just showing up a can-do attitude, being solution-focused, building your empire, putting your compass toward faith instead of fear. I had all these ideas back in 2014, 2015. I just wasn't living them yet. I was so scared to show up authentically. I was so scared to create a brand that had crowns on it or to coach with, you know, pictures of crowns on it because I thought no one's going to take me seriously because I'd had some feedback from my femininity being a deterrent um, to things. And I, I, I had all these beliefs that had piled up. No one's going to take me seriously if I'm too feminine. No one's going to, people are going to laugh if I wear a crown. People are going to judge me as being too young or too whatever. And so I dabbled. I spent a year and a half dabbling in my business. And what that really looked like was me being on the computer all the time. I have no idea what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, because I was like, I'm on my computer so much less now. But back then, like my husband made a joke that I couldn't sit down and watch just a half hour Netflix show mm. without opening up my laptop within 15 minutes, right. like after I had finished eating. Like it, it was, but I, so I spent this time dabbling and I wasn't getting traction. And like back in June of 2016, I had the opportunity of getting published in, um, in, in a book and I co-wrote an Amazon bestselling book with a whole bunch of other authors about entrepreneurship. And it was when that book came out, I was like, I feel like such a fraud because my business is not making money. Like I've had mm -hmm. businesses that made money, but this business isn't. And so I started to just explore like, what else could I do? How could I, how could I grow it? But I was still in that dabbling phase. And then I found out I was pregnant. And suddenly I was like, the, the, the clouds parted, the clouds of doubt parted because they had to. Because mm. I looked at my life at the woman that I was back then, and I was complaining. I was still in a spiral of blame. I wasn't taking ownership. I was still blaming my former business partner for this, that, and whatever. And it wasn't his fault. It wasn't my fault. Things just didn't work out. But I was stuck in this cycle of blaming, complaining, complaining and shame. So I wasn't owning all of who I was. I was ashamed of all of who I was. I was ashamed of having failed in my mind. I was ashamed of all these things that now I totally own. And I love the fact that I went through all of that because it gave me a business and life that I now absolutely freaking love. And the business supports the life that I love and supports us being able to be in Australia and travel the world, even though there's a, you know, a pandemic happening. Right. Like it's, it's, I'm so grateful for all those experiences, but it took a massive mindset shift to then jump into that space of ownership and being at cause. And right before I found out I was pregnant, I was on the phone with a coach who would end up being the woman who would end up being my first coach. And she was selling me on uh, the program of getting certified in NLP, timeline therapy and hypnosis. And I was like, I don't know. I was $35,000 in debt. I, I was like, I can't add more to a credit card. That just seems like irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And then I found out I was pregnant and like, she was the second person I told I was pregnant. And I said, I'm pregnant and I'm coming. And the course was two weeks later in Vegas. I put $4,000 on a credit card. I said, I'm, I'm going. Um, I told my, I didn't ask my husband for permission. I said, I need to do this. I'm going, I have to fix this because I knew I could. I knew that I'd recovered from bulimia with no psychological or medical intervention. And I completely transformed my identity from being somebody who hates her body, who punished her body to being someone who absolutely loves her body and who gets the results. Like I trust my body and I developed this amazing trust with my body. I just hadn't done that with money and I hadn't done that with business. And so I went on this journey. My business growth has been this wonderful personal development on steroids journey um, that has been really allowing me to see how money and the body are so similar mm. and how money and food are so similar because they're both a natural resource. They both are, are, an exchange of energy, 
Now there are, is there some forms of money that are, are less nutrient dense than others? Yeah. Is there some foods that are some less nutrient dense than others? Yeah. But I had to learn this whole path of ownership, this whole path of understanding money like I understand my body, um, of understanding um, who I really was and who and owning all of who I am and owning the fact that I am a challenger and that I do love to challenge people and that I do love cheerleading people on and that I do love creating and really finding that genius zone that I operate best in. And then I built my company so that I can hire other people for their genius zone. And then we both have mutual genius zones going at the same time. So I'm not working in all those things that I spent a year and a half kind of dabbling in because I didn't know how to do them. Mm -hmm. Now I have team to support that. And so that's, that's been the beautiful growth of, of, that empire uh, mentality of really looking at it from that queen's perspective of like, would a queen like actually do this or would she just like delegate it? Right. Like there are some times when you need to get in the nitty gritty and get in the dirt and like dig, dig this junk out of the moat yourself and, and show up as a leader and do it and say like, hey, we're all doing this. And then there's sometimes when you say, no, I'm gonna like, you, you take care of that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's something that's, that's in, that's in your realm. Right. That's, that's why you're part of the team. That's why I hired you or that's why, that's why you're part of my council. Right. Definitely. Yeah. It's a synchronistic symbiotic balance with you and uh, the rest of the team. And, you know, you touched on so many great and like inspiring points and I, that I think a lot <laughs> of people can relate with in terms of uh, going through like a personal journey within yourself to create this, you call it an empire. And I love that word for it because I, I feel like we all have the innate ability to create our own empire, essentially create our own reality. But I mean, you've experienced firsthand how there's certain fears, there's certain uh, <laughs> belief systems that we hold just about ourselves uh, that oftentimes can prevent that our, you know, potential our our empire mm -hmm. that we can create from actually becoming a reality uh, i mean what would you say like many of those fears like maybe where do they come from how do uh what was sort of some of the turning points for you recognizing sp specific fears within yourself and um i'm sure you could even speak to maybe experience of people you've worked with since yeah you've been able to start up the crown yourself yeah i think um one of the big ones that I love that I've, I've realized so many entrepreneurs struggle with is when they first start a business, they start it for the big, the big F freedom. Mm -hmm. Like they want to build freedom and they want to have freedom. They want to have financial freedom, but they more often than not, they box themselves into a job that's 24 seven that they don't a hundred percent love because they're not doing things that are in their genius zone. And I have seen a direct tie both with myself and with my clients in how much time uh, a leader is spending in their zone of genius and how much mo money they're making. So the more time you're spending in your zone of genius, the easier and the faster it is to grow. Like one of my mentors, she scaled her company from zero to 30 million in three years. Wow. And it's because of this one concept of really understanding uh, the zone of genius. What is it that you, that A, that you could do for free all day, every day, 24 and like not feel tired. Like it's not, it's like, it's coming from within. It's like that energy generation that comes from within where you actually come off and you're like, let's do it again. Like, let's mm -hmm. do it again. And so it's like coming off that ride and where you want to just like hop back in line and just do it again. Um, what is that thing that you do in your business? Like for me, I broke it down to three things. It's connecting, it's creating, and it's challenging. So if I'm doing those three things, then I am in that zone of genius. If I'm creating, whether that's creating new processes for, for, and new systems in my business, mm -hmm. or if it's creating content, or if it's creating on in like a podcast scenario like this, if it where we're creating a dialogue, which is also feeding into that connection one, and challenging. Challenging came from really looking at, I love personality tests, and I've done 
a ton of them. Mm -hmm. And what highlighted the challenging for me was um, I took the, the Enneagram test and that Enneagram test said I was like a combination of a three, which is the achiever and an eight. And one of my friends who's an Enneagram expert, she was like, you can't be both. <laughs> You're <laughs> one or the other. So like what feels best for you? And I sat with it and I was like, well, I've always been an achiever, but I think I was trained to be an achiever because my dad was an achiever. Right. And the one that was kind of tried to train out of me was the challenger which is partly why I was, I believe I was birthed to my parents was because I would challenge their hypocrisy in, mm -hmm. in essence. Like I would challenge when my dad would come home drunk. I didn't know at five that that's something you shouldn't do to somebody who's not sober, <laughs> but right. I would, I would challenge how he showed up because I always, and this is one of my superpowers. I always see somebody's highest and best in them before they do. Like if somebody tells me a dream, I see them achieving that before they do. Like I, I was working with a client for two years and at, when she first started with me, she was a hot mess. She was going through a divorce. It was messy. There was lots of stuff going on in her life. And then at the end of two years, she was becoming the director of operations for a uh, million dollar company. And she's like, I'm scaling this baby. And I was mm -hmm. like, damn girl. <laughs> I was like, and she's like, did you, did you believe that this could happen? I was like, a hundred percent. I'm just, I'm just so impressed by the fact that you took ownership of that dream. Like that was a thing. She had to own it. She had to own that dream. And I had to own the fact that I, I am skilled at challenging things that are no longer making sense. So challenging beliefs that no longer make sense. So I had to challenge my belief of of even just the name of my business. Cause for a while there, um, back in like 2016, 2017, I, I was so scared of this tr name crown yourself, even though I'd spent a pretty penny on buying that domain name, I was scared of like having coaching be under that umbrella. And I created like the Kimberly Spencer coaching. And cause I thought that was going to be more professional. And I used the same photos, just I didn't use any of the ones with the crown. Cause I was like, Oh, I can't do that because that's, that's not authentic. Like that's, like that, or that's not, you know, so no one will take me seriously. And it was this right. belief of, of the fear of judgment. And what I found was you will not attract your soulmate clients and customers when you're not being all of yourself. Mm. You will attract people who think you are what they think you are, because that's what you want them to think you are. But eventually those customers and those clients they they'll get progress and they'll get growth and they'll get results ideally, but they aren't going to be that like, Oh my gosh, here's a soulmate connection. Um, and I'm not talking soulmate in romantically. I'm talking right. like soulmate in a client relationship that, Oh my gosh, here's, here's somebody who just gets it and is all in and who just is, they want to stand out. They want to be different. They're okay with being different. They've always been different and they're okay with that. Like, and then that, when you, when you can speak to that and own all of that inside of you, whatever that, those things are for you, whatever those values are, then you start attracting the soulmate clients who are like, oh my gosh, where have you been all my life and in my business? And they're like, and then they get into your business and they're like, I love everything that you do. And like, you've helped me so much and like, you've transformed my life and this is amazing. And that, that is a soulmate client and customer. And so the, the beautiful thing is, is that the more you strip away that plagiarized programming of who people have told you or taught you that you should be to be successful, what you should do to be successful, and the more you have gone within to check inside yourself to see, does this really resonate as true for me? Does this really resonate as true and beautiful and right for me? Because it may work for somebody else. And this is why so many people get lost in everybody else's marketing strategies. Because they're not really checking in with themselves and saying, is this one that works for me? Now, there's, there's the, the differentiation that you have to check yourself if you are you know, checking in and saying it from a place of alignment or, or because fear is a sneaky one or checking in and doing it from a place of, Oh, I don't know if that's right for me because I did that for 
a year and a half in my business of like, oh, I don't, I don't know if maybe like saying I'm a coach is, is what I want yet right. and, or is, is right for me. And now I'm like, oh, I'm a high performance coach. I own that title. I love that title. Um, and it's not all of who I am, but it's definitely a lot of who I am. And so it's, it's, it's something that I had to figure out and allow for the process of discovery. Cause I think a lot of times we get stuck in this, in this plagiarized programming of what other people have said that we should be or whatnot. And so we lose that curiosity of like, what may, let's explore this and see if this is a fit. Let's explore this. Cause I, I, it took me like a, probably a year to find a, a coaching title that I really liked because mm. I never liked the term life coach. Cause I was like, I, I love you. I don't want to be with you for your whole life. I don't want you to think right. you have to hold my hand for the rest of your life. You got this. I want to empower you. I want you to own your results and own the lessons so that you'll just come to me, come back to me when you're at another level. And then we'll just do this dance again, mm-hmm. but not holding your hand. Like, like I need to, to be with you every single week of your life in order right. for you to, to debrief. Um, I wasn't really crazy about the term business coach cause I'm not getting, I, I do a different side of the business. I do the business in terms of the leadership and the performance development of the leader, which ripples into the business. I mean, many of my clients have doubled their income from working with me because they focused on increasing their clarity about who they are, increasing their clarity about what really is aligned and understanding their values on where, on how to make decisions based on their values, not on things that I say they should value, but on things that they've discovered that they should value on their own authentic clarity. And they've owned that and on their courage on showing up more courageously on having, it takes a lot of courage to be in, uh, to be fully yourself and fully be yourself and fully own yourself. And what I mean by that is owning the mistakes too. So many people can put up a fake photo on Instagram or any social platform and like have an inspirational quote, but not fully be living it. And I'll own it. I did it too. Like I I did it because I wanted to be inspirational and I was scared to be all of me. I was scared to be fully authentic, to share the messes, to share the mistakes that I've made because that's really where people learn the most. And I think the biggest mistake is when people uh, that I see a lot of entrepreneurs make is when they, they don't understand the business that they're really in. And so they think that maybe they've jumped forms into a different business. Like I've had a brick and mortar Pilates studio. I've had an e-commerce business and I've had crown yourself, my digital education business. And that each one is a different form but the same principles apply. And so sometimes we think that just because we've done something in another business that it's not going to like, we try to reinvent the wheel because it's in a, some different form. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily true. Like I was working with a client a few months ago and she had had um, a success, like a moderately successful business. Like it, it was, it was doing okay. Right. And she was wanting to become more of a coach, more of an influencer, um, and ha- have more of that sort of influencer personal branding business. And in that space, I said, well, you already have the no like, and trust factor with the people that you've already built a business with because they're already paying you, obviously. So have you shared with them about your goals and your dreams about for what it is that you're looking to create with this new business? And she's like, no, no, I, I, I want to keep the two separate. And I get that. And I had such empathy for that because I did the same thing with, with Crown Yourself and Pilates because i would had my Pilates studio and that was what was bringing in income, moderate income. Right. And I, I, I was scared to share about coaching with my Pilates clients because I didn't want to like cross streams in some way. Mm -hmm. And then it hit me and it dawned on me one day. And I was just like, that's so silly. (laughs) Like if they love me in one area as a Pilates, as their Pilates instructor, they're good. And they trust me with their body, which is their life. Right. I think they trust me with their mindset and their performance as well. And some of my Pilates clients transferred into being some of my greatest 
clients in, in my coaching business. And sometimes there's a, and it's all these fears of the ego, the fears of the ego that say that something is separate from something else. Like, oh, it's, a, oh, it's only a part of this business. It's not part of this business. And that's, that's the divisive nature of the ego to try to separate one thing from another when really it's all like the same principles apply. The people can right. still apply as well. Definitely. It's all interconnected in such, in ways that we don't even necessarily realize. And yeah. like that, that fear prevents us from tapping into that connection because you know when you have the trust of people dearly they are going to be willing to take it to the next level if you will with when you're open about your true aspirations and your whole self and you know I definitely relate to what you're saying in a sense of having to learn how to authentically show like all parts of me and like it's still a learning process like yeah still, you know I don't think we ever truly reach this this level of mastery I think maybe you reach a point where it's like somebody views you from the outside and it's like wow they're amazing at what they do and you know that's it certain doesn't mean that's wrong but I think there's always more to be willing to learn and more that you're willing to face and I think fears can manifest in like you think you conquer a fear and then what do you know, a year later, it shows up, it's the same underlying fear, the same root cause, but it shows up in a completely different uh, manifestation, if you will. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, as my as my mentor says, it's not new level, new devils, it's new level, same devils. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just in it. It's it's the same belief. It's the same fear of showing up. But it's just in a different form, or it's instead, maybe it's now like I was working with one of my clients, and she said, there was a fear of, of scarcity that she had with money. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into, and she, she conquered that. She like scaled way past that. Um, and then it turned into a fear of customer, of scarcity of, of customers um, from, you know, mm -hmm. this, that, and therefore of whatever reason of, you know, customers, a disgruntled customer said something. Right. And she's like, oh, well, then they're going to they're going to cause all these other customers to like go away or to like they're not going to no other customers are going to want to come into my business. And I was like, is that ultimately true? Is that really ultimately true? Like you have three people who don't really like your product and your business, which is you know common. There are always going to be people that are disagree or are negative Nellies or Debbie Downers. I literally have it on my website that I won't work with <laughs> those <laughs> types of people. <laughs> um, and you have like thousands upon thousands who love your product or who are like just totally okay with your product and who like your product. Like let's, right. let's do a little math here because look at what you've been able to create, but it was that same devil of scarcity that kept popping up and that fear and that lack of trust that she was going to be supported through any, through anything that she went through. Right. And so that's a perfect, that's a perfect example of the same exact fear manifesting. And I kind of relate to that in a sense. I think we tend to, a lot of times, like we tend to focus on one small, like ne what can per be perceived as negative, if you will. And yeah. uh, immediately our attention gravitates towards what might be lacking or missing or what we, instead of being grateful for, you know, like you said, the thousands of people who love what you're doing. I remember when I got my first one star review on the podcast and I was like oh my gosh like what am I gonna do but uh, you know and it was easy for me to lose track of the fact that all these other people still loved it and listened so I was like oh okay it was, you know you, you kind of learn to uh, I guess live with that that negativity it's always going to be there there's always going to be the uh, well it's biological like right. it's our, it's our brain's natural desire to survive and it's it's something that I think when you recognize that and you can give yourself a little bit of grace and say, Oh, okay, cool. Like that's awesome. Thank you brain for wanting to keep me alive because your brain, that good old amygdala always is looking out for like, where can I, where can I, you know, what, what danger is coming up? And so when that comes up and it's a nat, it's a natural response. Right. It's our job as conscious leaders to then sit it down kind of like a child and be like, Oh, cool. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you so much. Um, you did your job. Awesome. 
you know what? We have, you know, 40,000 or, you know, 400 other amazing reviews or 40,000 other clients or customers that we're serving. So thanks so much for bringing that to my attention. And uh, peace out. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, but give it a little bit of grace and acknowledge it because it, it is doing its job of keeping you alive. Right. So I like, instead of, I used, I used to fight it. I used to be like, no, I must be positive all the time and thinking of all these positive. And, and so, and that didn't really work for me because that started to, I, I started to ma- try, get angry that I was feeling these natural feelings that are normal, and, but negative. Right. And that didn't serve me at all in my manifesting journey or in the development of my business or growing as a leader because I don't believe that leadership is ignorance of the negative. It's not living in this positive bubble uh, or being an ostrich and just sticking your head in the sand when things, you know, when something's negative, like when something's negative, when you do get that customer who complains or you do get that negative review or you do get that thing, like your brain will pop up with a, with that, with like, like that, Oh my God, is this something we need to be concerned about? And that's just part of it's doing its job. So acknowledging it, giving yourself that grace that yes, we are human. And a part of being human is having a glorious rainbow of emotions. Mm -hmm. And in that rainbow of emotions, those emotions that are negative are, I like to think of them as like a package and they get sent to your door and you have to sign for them. Like Mm -hmm. when you sign for them is when you just basically accept that they're there. It's not saying that you have to open the package. It's not saying that you have to dive into it. But what happens is, is when you don't, when you don't accept that we've had those, those negative feelings or those fears or those, those scarcity beliefs, it's like that, um, that backlog of stuff that gets built up and it's getting built up at the warehouse. And finally, like you get that notification that they say, like, you got to pick up your stuff (laughs) and you you need a freaking U-Haul to take care of all that baggage. Where instead, if you just accept that that package of that crappy emotion or those feelings of scarcity or those old, like old beliefs um, and old sort of egoic beliefs just showed up at your door. You sign for them. You put the package in your living room and you say, I, I will look at it because inside that package, there are glorious learnings for you, but just sign it. it, No no one's saying that you have to change it. Or you have to, you even have to open the box at this moment. Like I was working with one of my clients and she was struggling with her Mm self-care. And I said, I'm just going to ask you, do you really want to care for yourself right now? Like if you were to really check in and she's like, Kim, I got to be honest. She said, I know I should say yes. And it feels really shitty of me that I feel like it's a no. And I said, there is power in that ownership of that. No, because it's a choice. It then becomes instead of like trying to live this should or this supposed to, she owned the fact that it was a no. I said, then if it's a no, then have it be a no. And just say like, when, when you just own the fact that you're choosing not to go to the gym, own the fact that you are choosing not to take those hot bubble baths and relax, own it, own it, like fully own it. If you're going to make that choice, and I'm not saying it's a bad choice. I'm not saying it's a good choice. I'm saying you're just, it's a, it's just a choice, right? But there is power in ownership of the, the, of fully owning even the stuff that you don't want to change. Mm-hmm. Even the stuff that you're like, you know what? I'm really, I, I don't want to change this habit right now and checking in and seeing, you know, when everybody says you should change it or you should change this, this thing and saying, um, I'm going to sit with the fact that I made this choice. Cause even that is putting yourself at least at cause. So it swings you into ownership, which then can swing you into action and owning new action. Right. But when you're stuck in shooting yourself, like I shouldn't be feeling this stuff. I, I'm not supposed to like, I'm, you know, I'm a conscious person. I'm not supposed to be feeling this stuff. I'm like, that's you also, you said you are, you are conscious and you are a person and right. people feel feelings of scarcity and fear and all of that. And that's okay. Right. And giving yourself that permission to have that. And then trusting that when you open that package, 
you're going to get a beautiful lesson inside. You're going to sit with that, with that package and you're going to understand something even deeper than trying to slap on your tool belt and fix it. Mm, definitely. And I, I agree a hundred percent. And it goes directly into the idea that you mentioned towards the beginning of just owning your full self and complete who you are. You know, I've, I've tried to learn for myself that try not to label any sort of emotions or feelings as good or bad, because, you know, when we yeah. start labeling anger or sadness as bad, then we start to almost unconsciously resent those feelings. And, you mm -hmm. know, I, I'm sure you, you could agree. We've never met a single person in our lives who hasn't felt anger, who, who hasn't felt sadness. Like that's just part of being human. And when you can sort of just own uh, whether it be whether it be an emotion like that or a behavior pattern that's ingrained into us, there just any any sort of action that we have or choice, it can be it can be empowering to just know that uh, we we are the creators of our reality. We are the creators mm -hmm. of our choices. And I think uh, I heard a great quote about a week ago. Somebody said that you can't really be a victim of your own choices. So you can you can almost sort of escape the the victim. You can want to be. Right. <laughs> you can want to be right. a victim of your own choices, but you can't. Right, exactly. It, it's very easy to almost trick ourselves into thinking we can be a victim of our own choices. Like we, without taking sort of full responsibility for the entire, you know, ship, if you will, that we're sailing mm -hmm. on. Like it's, um, and, I, and I don't think that's necessarily a fault of even the individual of having that mindset. That's something that's very much. Yeah. Uh, talk to us and we i think part of the uh process of becoming our full selves is learning to uh, accept that that belief system that's sort of ingrained and learning to overcome it and yeah uh, you, and retraining yourself right exactly and you know you speak a lot about uh you know leadership with this and i, I very much have come to the realization like re leadership the idea of leadership i think it plays hand in hand with this that a lot of people view leaders as, I, I always hear the phrase, like you're a natural born leader or like you're a, like you were born to lead all of these things. But I think that almost kind of takes away from the idea that I really think anybody can be a leader and leadership mm -hmm. is just sort of this, every, everything that we've spoken of encompassing our full being, understanding, like a willingness to look in inward and at all parts of ourselves and then use that to whether it be help others or just lead or just sort of express ourselves authentically. I, I, would you agree with that in the sense that every, leadership is something that anybody can do and it really is just a, a, an extension of our authenticity, an extension of these principles that we're talking about? I think that we all are examples in many ways of what's possible. And I think that, yes, anybody can be a leader. I think we all are leading in many ways, even though we don't know that we are. We're all leading someone. I was having a conversation with a client of mine, and she had 200 followers on Instagram. And she was like, oh, I, I, I only have, like, she's like, I don't have thousands. And I said, have you ever been in a room with 200 people? Mm. I said, my wedding had 150, and that was pretty, pretty big. And 200 people, that is 200 lives that are watching you do your life and watching your message and hearing and reading and seeing what it is that you have to say in the world. People are watching you and they're watching as to whether your life is an example or a warning. Because I, I mean, and I have a toddler now and he listens to what I do not to what I say I'm going to do. Like he listens and I hear him when he gives commands. I'm like, oh, I do that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's how I do it. Okay, cool. Um, when he's, he's very direct and my husband and I speak with a lot of candor. Like we've always had very explicit communication saying what we want um, and, and having that mutual respect for each other where we speak explicitly. And our son is now demonstrating those, those leadership qualities. But I think people, like, I think leaders 
everybody is leading in some way because people are following and watching you. Now, are if they're choosing to continue to follow and watch you, that depends on if you're showing results that they either want to achieve or that they're familiar with achieving. So results that they want to achieve are like aspirational results and dreams and goals that they have. And so they're following you because they would, you know, love to have, you know, a billion dollar Kylie Jenner empire, (laughs) or they would love to have, you know, a multi-million dollar launch, or they would love to be able to live for and work from wherever, or they're following you because of our desire to have community and familiarity, or as some would say, safety in, um, in the stuff that they're already kind of stuck in. So mm. that's where commiserate comes or commis- commiserating comes in. I call it commiserate because it's like community misery right. where right. you're relating to somebody else's negative stuff. And you're so addicted to living in those negative emotions that that's where your energy is going and your output is going. So you're connecting and with other people who are of the same beliefs, who are of the same emotions, who are at that same vibration. And so when you, so, so we all are leading in some way, but are we leading and generating more leaders or are we leading and generating more followers Mm. and are, and that's, that's a big differentiation to make. And I think, especially, I mean, and leadership comes down. It's not just like owning a business. It's also, you know, in your home, like I consider my husband and I to be the queen and queen me and (laughs) king of uh, him, um, our, of our home. And we rule together. And we are setting the example for what is possible for our son. We are setting the example for communication. We are setting the example for what a relationship, a loving, amazing relationship looks like for him and having that awareness that he is watching us. And especially if you have kids, you are a leader, whether you like it or not in that position, you are a leader because they are watching what you do. They are watching how you treat your, your partner. They are watching everything and they may not listen to what you say, but they are definitely going to mimic what you do. Mm, right. And that's a, that's a fantastic point. And I ne- didn't necessarily think about it in that sense of that. Everybody is uh, almost get, especially in the day and age of social media, everybody has, at least everybody who has social media has this sort of community around them. And it, I've seen firsthand how uh, almost what you talked about with the negative uh, attraction, if you will, vibrating mm-hmm. at the same frequency where you can get very attached to seeing almost like a, a mimicking of your own lifestyle. Cause that's something yeah. that I experienced firsthand. And when I was willing to sort of look within myself and step outside of that frequency, those people sort of almost just naturally vibrated out of my life. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that comfort in that, that you have in that community, even if it's negative, can be very fearful of losing that because a lot of times our identities are based around that. Our our whole life, as we know it, is based around uh, this this way of living that we have. And so, the idea of change and growth it's it's fearful. You know, I think most of our fear comes from the fear of the unknown. So it can be anytime there's a, a new challenge or a new like idea, or a new way of living. Any you name it, even if it's like for the good it can be it challenges our identity it challenges our uh way of living and so i i think the the positive type of leadership that we're talking about with creating Mm -hmm. of leaders it almost stems from that willingness to grow the willingness to face fear that willingness to change and i think people will pick up on that even if you're not super outward with it if you're if Mm -hmm. you know just even the small samples of growth and the the subtle changes i think people realize that so i think people can be this this beacon of leadership a lot of times without even knowing it whether it be online or the people around them you know your family Mm -hmm. your friends and you know people see those changes and can get inspired by that and be willing to change within themselves or at least start the process and 
reach out on that to some, you know, mm -hmm. in some sort of role. So it almost has like a domino effect if you're willing to uh, lead, lead within yourself. And, you know, I, I think the most effective leaders don't necessarily go out looking to right away at least impact everybody around them, but they do it. It just happens by, by storm, if you will, because they take that change within themselves. And mm -hmm. I think that can be so empowering. Um, and you, you touched on a, a great point. There are of, of people moving into and out of your circle and allowing for that ebb of, and, and flow. The more clear, and, I, and I've seen this both with myself and with my, with my clients, the more clear you are on who you are, what you stand for, what you want, mm -hmm. what your values are, the more courageous you are on speaking up for and about who you are, what you want, what you stand for and what your values are, the more people that who are totally in alignment with that will gravitate to you. And the more that people are who may have been a part of your circle are not in alignment with that, they will remove themselves from you maybe with a little bit of discord from time to time but that was that i experienced this like purge when i went through my buyout where i saw that just my my business partner and i had very different values and i had started to become very challenging i'd stepped into my role as a challenger back then um, without knowing it because it's just natural to me mm -hmm. challenging um decisions and that that and and that dis there was a dissonance with the the values that we were bringing to the business because we never sat down and really decided what the values of this business baby were and so he came in with his stuff i came in with my stuff and then it created eventually um when you have two opposing values not saying that it's a good value or a bad value but when when one has you know uh structure and so when one has some stability as a value and the other one has action taking as a value sometimes taking action to sometimes taking those risks for in in business it doesn't feel stable mm -hmm. but for me when i take risks or when i do things that other people will say are crazy like you know moving to australia in the middle of a pandemic and choosing to just stay here since we were here anyways <laughs> while on vacation or, you know, having my, whether it was having my son naturally, like with midwives or, or whatever it was, or whether it was marrying a man who was 19 years older than I am. Like I've had people judge those decisions, but the more I own that that was my decision, the decision has to take root. So when you start owning all of who you are and you are really rooted in that, invariably, like there will be wins that come to try to knock that little tree of that decision down but the deeper your roots are into that decision the stronger you will be able to withstand the winds and the more you will be like hey that wind is not a freaking hurricane it's a breeze right. like <laughs> i'm good i'm good okay thank you thank you for breezing right by me and no longer needing to be a part of my garden right that that awareness that when you set those decisions and you make those decisions and you're clear about yourself, who you are, what you want and what your values are and what you stand for, and you have the courage to show up for them, people who aren't resonating or vibrating at the frequency of courage, who, who tend to maybe be in fear, or maybe they're ashamed of who they are, or maybe they feel guilty about things that they've done in their past that they don't feel like they can fully own yet, in that space, they're not going to resonate with you at that same level. And they probably will excuse themselves from your world. Right. Absolutely. Maybe with, with some discord, but, or maybe not. Sometimes they will quietly go and sometimes they won't. But the more you are unshakable in that, in the roots of who you are and the clarity and the courage to stand for that fully, all of you, that that changes the game for how you show up for the people who are like, oh my gosh, this is totally my type of garden. Like I want to, I want to play on this this right. gigantic tree that you are growing. Like I want, let's build it, let's build a tree house in this. Like it's gonna be fun. <laughs> 
so that's and that and that's the people that you want to have in your business that's what the people that i call soulmate clients that's the people that will just show up because they absolutely freaking they resonate with the values they resonate with the courage they resonate with the clarity that you have and even if if they don't want the same things as you they still will be like i that energy that you have that you generate from clarity because clarity is a powerful energy and when you tie that with courage oh that energy is what people are drawn to like i've had never in my history of owning a business ever from whether it was pilates to i was kind of more on the back end of my e-commerce company but from pilates to coaching everyone has commented on energy was the reason that they hired me energy and authenticity it was never about how many certifications i have how many things that, you know how many degrees i have and zero <laughs> like <laughs> how many like how many it was never any of that and yet i've i've worked with people i've worked with three phd's now as clients nasa scientists who have come to me for coaching and because of energy and it's the energy of clarity the energy of courage and the ability to communicate that that changes the game for how you show up as the ruler as the queen or king of your life right 100 percent, and i love that it was a beautiful analogy with uh the basically planting your own garden and you know sometimes yeah. a little bit of wind can feel nice like it's a nice breeze and that's actually you know if we're going to use that analogy again that wind is what makes trees stronger you know they're mm -hmm. able to withstand more and more so when that hurricane comes around eventually the the foundation is so solid in its roots that it can withstand it and it can survive it and you know i think for a lot of people maybe the most difficult part of when you're trying to truly find yourself and explore what that foundation is those boundaries and that uh mm -hmm. setting that boundaries and setting who you are can be the most difficult part. And that can feel like, you know, those, sl those small winds can feel like a hurricane because you haven't fully figured out that, that root system yet. And mm -hmm. I, th I think that just comes with time that comes with exploring that comes with, uh, real practice, practice, <laughs> practice. It's all it comes practice. with a lot of practice. It's like, we're, we're in a, in an age where you can get everything instantly. You can, you, you know, you have, you're feeling a certain way. You can pop a pill for that. Like <laughs> you can pop a pill. It'll take it away. Well, it'll mask it, Right. but it's, it's a practice. It's like yoga. Like you get on your mat and you do the work. And sometimes you get on the mat and the most work that you're doing that day is child's pose. And right. sometimes you get on the mat and you are rocking your vinyasanas and you're doing your flows and you're doing your warriors and you're feeling st so strong in it but it's a practice of showing up. I mean, really most of it is just showing up a hundred percent for yourself. Right. Most of authenticity is showing up and having the courage to sit and showing up requires courage to say, this is who I am. This is what I want. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I remember when I was so scared when I told my husband that I, I knew I was falling in love with him. And I said, uh, I know you didn't have kids with your first wife. Um, I know we've only been dating for a little while, but I got to say, like, I cannot take this any further if you don't want kids because it's a non-negotiable for me. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I was like, what's he going to say? <laughs> right. And he said, with you, I could totally see having kids. And I knew he would be the best dad ever. Like he's amazing <laughs> as a father. It's my, I tell him it's my favorite job that he has in all the world. Like I said, if you did nothing else, like being the best dad to our children is like that. Mm, that's that's all I need. That's, that's enough. enough. That's, that's a hundred percent enough for me. Right. So it's, it's, it's that, that is, that is so powerful that when, but I wouldn't have had that had I not had the clarity of what I wanted, which was have to have kids and that the courage of which required trust and me trusting that, okay, if it's not with him, then it's going to be with somebody else, but I'd really like it to be with him. So I'm going to have the courage to have to say it because right. sometimes we don't, we dally around what it is that we want because 
of fear of rejection or judgment or just fear itself. And so we delay on having those courageous conversations and we delay on explicitly stating what it is that we want. And thus it's, it, it, and then we're, we're surprised when two years down the road, it's not what we thought it would be or what it, right. we thought it would turn into be, but how can you have it turn into being anything if you haven't communicated, especially in a relationship, if you haven't mutually communicated what the vision for the relationship is. The same is true for business. Like if you haven't clearly defined what the vision for the business is with your team, with, with your customers, with what it is that you're working on creating, then how are they supposed to know that this is anything more than just, you know, a paycheck? Or how, that, how are they supposed to know that this is, you know, soul work, that this is your mission? Unless you say it repeatedly, consistently, courageously. <laughs> like, you have to say it and have the courage to, and the clarity to say, know what it is that you're saying and have the clarity, the courage to say it when you want it. Absolutely. And when you speak it, oftentimes that's the first step of truly living it and embodying it and like feeling it. Because once, once the words are out there, they've been spoken, they are that is that's like for me that's the first step of making it reality making it real mm -hmm. and you know coming from uh, a, a teacher's perspective start up school tomorrow yay but uh, uh, coming from a teacher's perspective this is something i wish i would seen i would see more of within like teaching of the younger generations and teaching the next you know generation of the people who are going to be in charge of the world you know the ones who are going to be running the show and I, I see a lack of the the teaching of empowerment within ourselves, mm -hmm. the lack of teaching um, how to fully, you know, all the principles that we've talked about, you know, what encompasses uh, leadership, what encompasses, what you know, what does it mean to be open and be our full selves and be authentic and genuine? And how do, how do we reach our full potential? You know, a lot of, I think, schooling, today unfortunately it just comes down to standardized tests and sort of how do we get you through the system and yeah it teaches you what to think not necessarily how to think well right exactly exactly it's almost I, I i think indoctrination is a very strong word and sometimes i'm hesitant to use it but it is almost an indoctrination to a certain line of uh subservient thinking which isn't necessarily beneficial if we're you know wanting a society of self-actualized empowered like individuals so i'd love your, your you know your thoughts of how how we make this a this line of thinking more mainstream per se and make it something that is um i guess easily accessible to people and you know and encouraging people to not be afraid to look into their full aspects of their being like do we need almost sort of a societal re like reprioritizing what we're focusing on like what is your thoughts on breaking this as a more um l a larger concept and accessible for more people well i think we definitely have had a societal shakeup in the past six months right <laughs> um having a stark mirror held to our faces of all the things that we like and don't like currently in in the world and in our relationships and in our families and i think that that is one thing that i think first of all i think personal development should be taught in schools from kindergarten period I agree. I agree. um in in fact pre-k like i love the fact that my son's pre-k he's able to go to pre-kinder here in australia and his teacher i was watching her and she um he was climbing up a little ladder to climb down a slide and he was like, mama, help me. And I was like, you got it, buddy. You can do it yourself. Um, and, but before I said that, she said that. And I said, mm. you're his teacher. <laughs> you're his teacher. Because you're teaching him that he will figure it out, not that he's smart. Like, that's a big differentiation. Like, I was always taught that I was smart, but I had to learn that I could figure things out. Right. And I had to train that as a muscle because when you're smart, what happens is when you're conditioned that you're smart and you just pass all these tests and you get all these A's is you are training yourself that what happens when you get into a room where you're not the smartest person in the room and you don't get an A 
or you don't get a, you know, a B or you don't get the promotion or you don't get the thing. Suddenly your identity is called into question because your identity, I am smart is now, wait, maybe I'm not. What if I'm not? These accomplishments define me as this. So I think personal development should be taught in school from like (laughs) pre-K on. It also, like one of my missions is to impact children, but it starts with the parents. It, it, it starts with the parents first of, of teaching the parents how to be empowering to their kids instead of enabling, how, teaching how to, because a lot of times we think, oh, well, I'm just being loving by picking up their toys for them. Are you? Mm. Or are you teaching them that, you know, are you enabling them to think that mommy will always be there to help them out, to pick up their toys, to do things, you know, for them instead of do things with them? Like i I, we tell our son to pick up his toys and he asks us for support to do it with him. And of course, because we're training that muscle also to ask for support. Um, I think that there is a a deeper seated belief of enoughness with a lot of parents of trying to prove how enough you are, prove how strong enough you are, prove how capable enough you are, prove how, you know, smart enough you are from doing all these things for our kids and I don't think, I think that that's a, 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 the lie of pride, where instead it's really about asking for support, asking for help, asking for, um, asking for that, t- training that muscle to ask. And I think that, that can be started from as young as, you know, pre-K of training the muscle of asking for help. Like the number one thing that I see from people who struggle is they are like, I'm not asking for, I, I, I feel like a burden if I'm asking for help. I'm like, actually, you're doing the other person a favor because by help, by asking for help, it's actually boosting their self-esteem within them of like, oh, I actually can do something for you. So, I mean, it, that is one thing. I think, pers- so personal development, I think is key. I think it starts at, it, with families. It starts with at, at home. Like I always used to tell my clients whenever I was, whenever I teach them or coach them that I'm like, I'm with you for like one hour a week. You're with yourself the whole rest of the day, the whole rest of the week, all the other hours. So how can you make these lessons, these learnings, these new beliefs that you're creating in this area, these new habits, how can you make these for you as natural as breathing? So that it's super easy for you. It's it's a no-brainer. It's it's normal for you to question when you have a negative thought. To question is this ultimately true? To 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 allow yourself to feel the emotions. I think empathy is something that also needs to be taught in our schools, especially with the rise of bullying. Like I was bullied in school. So many people were bullied in school, and like I. <laughs> middle yeah. school middle school is just a special age for so oh, many yeah. Oh, yeah. um and that and that age is a time when empathy and compassion like these are things that we can teach and eq earlier on to then train that as a muscle so that by the time they hit teenage years ideally they'll have a little bit more empathy and compassion because where does bullying come from? A lot of bullying comes from personal insecurity. Right. So you project it onto somebody else who's weaker or less than, but that's, that's just, again, the ego trying to separate us and divide us from really the fact that we are all one. We are all united as a, as a human race. And so allowing for the teaching compassion, teaching how to feel your emotions. Like that's a skill set that was never taught to me in school. It was never taught to me at home. I had to learn it when I was 17 years old in acting class because I had no idea how to actually feel my emotions. I had gotten so used to shutting them down and just being this achiever, uh, this automaton achiever on like, and, and doing all the things, but instead, and just pushing my feelings aside. Meanwhile, I was bulimic. So what is bulimia? I was shoving feelings down. I was then 
adding, binging on even more feelings because I was feeling shame for having those first feelings in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I was shoving it down. And then eventually it exploded. And so my feelings would explode. My lunch would explode. Like it, it was not a, a pretty time because I didn't know how to process feelings. I didn't know how to search for emotional triggers. I didn't know what my values were and nor did I have the conversations with my parents about looking at like, what are the values and having it be a safe place for discovery of values instead of you should have this as your value. There's a big right. difference <laughs> between that. And that's how you really be learn how to become that authentic version of you. Like I had one of my clients, she said, do you teach this any of this values stuff um, that we've done in her business that has transformed her business. Um, do you teach any of this to, to teenagers? Cause she was having a conversation with one, one of her teenagers and about values. And her teenager was like, I don't know what values I have. And I was like, well, her teenager is really in the age of discovery. So try on a value. What if you put health as your first value? What if you did that? What would your, what would your habits look like then? What would you be doing? Would you be going out and doing volleyball practice every day? Would you be choosing to eat more nutritious meals? What would you be cutting out the junk food? Like what if you put health as your primary value? What if you put connection as your primary value? What would you be doing then from that? How would you connect with your, your peers? How would you uh, support, you know, your teammates? How would you, how would you show up if, if you put connection as one of your primary values? So allowing for that exploration and discovery to see what it is. And I, and I love personality tests. And so the bank personality test is a really fantastic, easy one. Um, you can go to crackmycode.com forward slash uh, Spencer for that. And it's, um, it's a super fast one. It takes 90 seconds. Not only does it take, is it helpful for business owners because it teaches you how your customers make buying decisions, but it also is helpful for parents because it teaches you how your kids make buying decisions. Mm -hmm. So, will they buy into the idea of doing their homework before going out to play or will they buy into the idea of participating in community service? You will be able to communicate it according to their values. And if they know how they make buying decisions, then they also can have a greater awareness as to what those values are because it isn't another personality test that's rooted in values. Right. And that's, you touch on so many important topics and the idea of values and uh, I feel like we all can be taught. Like, I think everybody wants to be like a good person. Everybody wants yeah. to be empathetic. Everybody wants to lend a helping hand when they can. Cause, uh, but I think we're, we don't know how to do that. We're not taught that. And you know, we're not taught is, the how. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And there's this illusion of separation, like you pointed to like disconnecting us from one another. And mm -hmm. we, we forget that we are all one. We are all one humanity. And when we can, learn the natures of empathy and tap into that because we can all be empathetic that's not again i hear the the same thing with leadership i hear that some people are just naturally empathetic it's more of mm -hmm. they've worked on that they've been able to use it as a um it's one of their strengths and i think anybody can build that but and it possibly hasn't been conditioned out of them right like i had one of my i had one of my older male clients and he he's super 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 empathetic but he was taught all growing up, you know, rub some dirt in it, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, right. boys don't cry, blah, blah, blah. And all of that crappy programming. So he had conditioned himself out of feeling for decades. Mm. And he turns out to be one of the most generous, kindest feeling, deep feeling persons ever. Right. But it came from it, like it was conditioned out of him in a way. Right. And so him showing up as his full authentic self is him showing up and showing that empathy and allowing for the tears and allowing for those moments of pain and, and sorrow and sadness and things that happen. Right. Definitely. And I, I think allowing that is what also brings the beauty. It's what brings the yeah. moments in life that, you know, we sit back at the end of the day and it's like, this is what I live for. This is who I am. This is what I want to do. And I think everybody exploring that, it'll look a little bit different in terms of what the strengths are, what it is that they're bringing to the table. But I think that's how you create a, you know, when I ask the question about society, that's how you create that synchronistic, harmonious, loving, mm -hmm. um, balanced world when everybody brings their, 
strengths and their potential. Yeah. If we could have everybody bringing their best version of themselves unapologetically, I mean, like, what an amazing world. <laughs> oh, we're, and we could accept them for where they are if we had the ability to just be like, okay, I know that guy just cut me off in traffic. I accept that. And, I, you know, he probably just is having a rough day. I'll let him go ahead. He probably needs to get someplace emergent. Maybe. Maybe his kid got into an accident and he needs to, he's right. racing to the hospital. You know, if we just had that level of just compassion and awareness and ownership also of our own mistakes, of being, uh, of allowing ourselves to, to, to own the mistakes that we've had and to, to trust that we're not the only ones going through that. We're not the only one who's, who's made that mistake first and foremost. Like I know when I was bulimic, I thought I was the only one who was, who hated their body. I was, like, I was the only girl in middle school who actually had body image issues, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> but that's, that's just the illusion of fear of it, it separates us. And instead, when I started teaching Pilates, I mean, I was still uh, struggling with body image. But when I started teaching Pilates, that was the beauty of uh, opening my eyes up to perspectives. Suddenly I had 10 hours of 10 different perspectives every hour, every hour of bodies, of mm -hmm. bodies, of lifestyles, of ways of behaving and believing and different belief systems and different habits. And I was like, oh, and it was in that, that was actually my training ground to see you can choose your beliefs just like you cho choose your wardrobe. Like you can choose how you're going to show up in the world. Right. Just like how you choose your clothes for the day. And so maybe you want to try on a different style of belief. Like maybe you want to try on a more abundant belief. Like what if I did believe that everything was possible? What if I did believe that I could have, you know, X amount of dollars in the bank? Or what if I did believe that I could have the most amazing soulmate that who just inspires me and fills, fulfills my every desire and need? Like, what if I did just ha believe like that I could have a body that I absolutely loved? What I wonder what that would be like. And then pick that shirt and, and put that on and test it and just see how it works. And at first it's going to feel awkward because it's not your normal like wardrobe. It's not what you, it's not your normal style. It's not what you normally wear. But eventually you may lean into that feeling like, oh, this feels pretty like pretty rocking. Like I never used to wear av avocado green ever. I was a prickly pink kind of gal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then suddenly... <laughs> And, and my mom had said, she'd said, oh, avocado green is just not your color. And I was like, but I really like avocado green. I really like the color. Like, I really like greens. Right. And I had had green conditioned out of me for a while. And then I just was like, I'm going to try wearing some more green. I like green. And then it just, it grew, it grew on me. So right. your beliefs can be like shirts and you just got to change your wardrobe. Right. Oh, exactly. and Evan, I do have a heart out at, uh, 825 just letting you know okay yeah i was about to say uh this is <laughs> i mean we're we're at about just over an hour oh past an hour so um i'd love to you know just finish off where yeah. this, is, this has been a fantastic conversation by the way so i i, I, I really, appreci I really appreciate you coming on here because i'm i'm going to be leaving feeling inspired and empowered myself so. <laughs> um, i have to ask how how did crown yourself the the name wh why did it resonate so strong for you what was the personal meaning you said in the in the beginning yeah so when i was when i was 18 i got so this is kind of it's i'll make this a quick story but when i was 18 years old i got my first tattoo on a whim with one of my good friends one of my best friends at the time and he said we're gonna go get this tattoo and it means to crown yourself a champion and to be and i you know i still have it it's a little tiger with a crown and so <laughs> to crown yourself a champion and at the time when i first got it i was like oh i kind of really i like that mentality but it wasn't something i was living by yeah and so i over the years this this has actually stayed my favorite tattoo and one i'm most connected with because it's it was representative of a a life that I wanted to fully embody, but I had too much fear to really like fully be, fully be who I was meant to be. And ever since I've been working towards living in that, uh, it's it's that crown yourself, that idea is something that always comes back to me. So it's just- I, I thought, love it. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I love that so much. Right, I was like, when when I saw your business was crown yourself, I was like, wow, what a, what a coincidence. Like, no, no way. So 
Perfect divine timing, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was meant to be. So uh, I'd love you to just, if you wanted to leave the listeners where they can go and find your work, where they can interact with you further and uh, whether it be social media, your websites, I guess anywhere you'd like to send them. Anywhere. Yeah. So you can find me on crownyourself.com. It's <laughs> very simple. Crownyourself.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at crown yourself now and for some cheeky quotes and inspiration and but crownyourself.com is the main hub if you want to dive into any of the work that i do i have tons of blogs i have and since you are all podcast listeners i do also have a podcast called the princess and the bee for all the bees of our lives from business to babies to bodies to boys to bank accounts to belief systems and to boldness so join me on The Princess and the Bee and at crownyourself.com. And I would love to hear from you. Um, and you can always email me at info at crownyourself.com because I would love to hear your takeaways, your breakthroughs, if any of this episode served you. I, I always love hearing from my, my fellow podcasters and podcast listeners. Awesome. And I'll, I'll definitely link all of that in the description below. So it's right there. And um... You know, I, I'm leaving feeling inspired, so I know the listeners are as well. So, you know, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, um, you know, bringing your presence and bringing your, your loving, warm energy to the podcast because you're truly, it's truly you an so inspiration. Much. So, great. Oh, listening. Evan, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. It has been an honor. And I told you, we set the intention for this to be an amazing interview. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was. The intention has been met. When the intention is set, in, and it's like, we're just going to go with it. We're going to see where it goes. It's generally, the intention is met. So, oh, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right. And with that, All right. we can...